Welcome to this week's Everton show. Well, we nearly got the London double that we wanted, didn't we? Tony Bell, you delivered on the Saturday night at an electric O2 arena, but Tottenham were just too good for the Blues on Sunday afternoon at White Hart Lane. The bomber can now take some time out, but the players can only dust themselves down and go again. To make sense of it all, I'm joined this week by Graeme Stewart and also by Kevin Sheedy. Welcome back, Sheeds. It was nearly the perfect weekend. Yeah, it was a brilliant fight by, uh, by Tony on a Saturday night and set the weekend up nicely. But unfortunately, Tottenham on the day were, were better than us and uh, we, got, we got beat. Just too much to ask for, wasn't it, I suppose, the perfect double, Graham? Yeah, maybe just pushing it a little bit too far. But we were all ecstatic about the result for Tony. Unfortunately, we couldn't follow, follow it up on the Sunday. But you know, sometimes you've got to give credit where it's due. Tottenham were very, very good on the afternoon. It was a good sporting weekend, that's for sure. And there's plenty more to come from Sheeds and the Diamond in this week's show. And they'll be joined along the way by this little lot. Yeah, I'm really proud. Um, I'm, I'm happy for everybody that helped me throughout this journey. I'm happy that uh, they helped me throughout this way, but you know, for me, the most important thing is the team. When you see the size of that pillow <laughs> and, uh, and the colours it's making, then it's not very good, but the spoils of war, shall we say. No, it's been a great season for myself and the team, and I think this just tops it off for myself, but what will top it off for the team is winning the region. If you play six against six, compare that uh, the last week uh, to the first week of the season, that's a big difference. Now, last Sunday's game at White Hart Lane may have ended in disappointment, but we did at least get the chance to see Romelu Lukaku create a brand new Everton Premier League goal scoring record when he placed his 61st strike very neatly past Hugo Lloris. We caught up with Big Rom at USM Finch Farm this week and we invited the previous record holder along to join him. That's a great achievement, isn't it? Such a uh, short period of time. He's not played many games and he's, he's battered the goals and so fair play to him. He's a fantastic player and he's a real goal machine. Yeah, I'm really proud. Um, I'm, I'm happy for everybody that helped me throughout this journey. I'm happy that uh, they helped me throughout this way, but you know, for me, the most important thing is the team. I want the team to win. We have a lot of potential and it's time to fulfil our potential, I think. Honestly, I'm not that disappointed. I've lost the record now. I mean, I, 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 but um, I'm sure Rom will score many, many more goals. He gets himself in good areas and he's, he's brave because sometimes as a striker, some strikers don't want to get in there. Rom always gets in there, he misses a chance, but he comes back and he scores again. So he's brave to get into the right areas. Like I said, we didn't know about it until, what was it? Yeah, a few six, months, yeah, a few, few months, six months, months ago. Yeah. That's the thing, we don't, we don't, we don't roll like that. Like, we, we just, we, like on the game, he just comes to me, tells me about the defenders, what he's seen. And then we just work and that's it. We are not really focused on the records. We want to win games. And uh, I mean, that's the, the, the mentality that I have. He has the same. So that's what we don't, our only focus. Yeah, but Rom's obviously got a, a real hunger for to score goals. You can see that in the training ground every day. He's a perfectionist. He works extremely hard. He works off his left foot, he works off his right foot. He, he's an all-round player. And um, yeah, and um, it's, it's, his hard work's paying off. He's always the one that gets me out there, who is the one that is willing to help me doing my finishing and stuff. So it's been a nice journey and, you know, we, we are happy that the, the, with the work that we are delivering. But like I said, we both know that uh, I can do more and I want to do more and I want to help my teammates achieve more. So um, we're happy for the moment, but we have to move on forward like, uh, like we do all the time. Kev, big run there. Paying a lot of credit to Duncan Ferguson. You've worked with Big Duncan as a coach. What sort of bits and pieces will he have passed on to Romelu Lukaku? Uh, he's a very passionate coach. Uh, really thinks about you know coaching sessions, always trying to come up with new ideas. And obviously his finishing drills are, are paying dividends. I mean, Rom's just a goal machine at the moment. He's oozing confidence. Doesn't look like he's going to miss. And he's, he's in great hands with, with Big Dunk. So Big Dunk won't just be teaching him how to get up and head the ball and be physical. He will be bringing certain tactical aspects to his game. Indeed, yeah, he'll be doing different movements for him to, you know, to, to get into scoring positions and, and obviously uh, just repetition on the, on the training ground of, of goal scoring. When Rom gets through on goal at the moment, Graeme, he just doesn't look as if he's going to miss. I think that's the biggest compliment we can pay him. You know, we, we fully expect the net to bulge. Um, you know, and it doesn't matter whether it's on his left foot, his right foot against Tottenham on Sunday. You know, he just doesn't seem to miss. At the very least, he hits the target and makes the goalkeeper work. You've been a wide player, Kev. In the great Everton side, you put plenty of balls in for Sharpie. It must make a real difference. It must be great for a wide player. 
when you know if your delivery is right, somebody's going to get in there and be on the end of it, like a Sharp, a Gray, a Fergus, nor a Lukaku. Yeah, he's just got the knack of being in the right place. So as you say, as a wide player or a midfield player, you just get your head up and you know, he, you know, if you can get the ball through to him, he's going to score. Or from crosses, you know, he's he's he's, he's got the whole. Uh, he can finish with all so, all three. Can you can you coach a young footballer to finish, or has it got to be to a certain extent? You've got to be a born finisher. I think you've got to be a natural finisher. Um, you can uh, help, you know, make him become better, but he's got to have the, the knack of being in the right place and also having the, uh, the ability to put the ball in the back of the net. I tell our young players that's the hardest thing to do in football is to put the ball in the back of the net. And you've got to have that hunger, that selfishness, I suppose, Graham. Yeah, to a degree, you've got to have some selfishness about you as well. You've got to, you know, see the whites at the post and you just head for them and, and you know, you make sure you get your shot on target. But, um, you know, I think Romelu's qualities, you know, have go far wider than just goal scoring. You know, there's plenty for him to still work on. You know, when he gets in the channels, he's got great ability, he's got great strength, he can create goals for other people as well. So there's an awful lot more to come from him. He's still a young man at 23. I was just going to say, still a baby, isn't he, compared to some well, strikers? Well, he is really. I mean, when you look at, I mean, there's some players out there who haven't made a debut at 23 years of age. So when you can look at what Romelu's record is and what he's done in that period of time, I mean, it is really stand out. It's fabulous. And I'm sure there's more to come from Romelu Lukaku. Now, of course, the big sporting news of last weekend was obviously the fantastic win for Tony Bellew against David Hay on Saturday night. The lifelong Evertonian gave the performance of his life to beat his somewhat outspoken opponent, but his 11th round victory certainly took its toll, as we found out when Tony Bellew came to Finch Farm on Monday morning to start the recovery process. Uh, do you know what? I'm a, I feel a little bit better after being in the... Uh the ice box, as we like to call it, the cryotherapy really helps me, and the, the medical staff here always look after me and make sure I'm right. Yeah, but you know, you, you can't make it right. The pain I'm in, so it's good pain, I suppose. It could be worse, could be a loser, but when you see the size of that pillow, <laughs> then uh, and the colours it's making, then it's not very good. But the spoils of war, shall we say? You know, that's what it is. And I've come out the winner, and I'm victorious. So you know, I'm happy. I'm happy, just happy to get home safe to me three kids and missus. Ronald Koeman looked like he enjoyed the conversation with you there in the Finch Farm corridor. He did, he did. He's, uh, he was throwing the punches with me at times, <laughs> telling me, you know, go and do him, finish him now. And I said I was trying my very best, but it, it, was, it was tough at times in there. It was a hard fight, uh, a long fight, longer than anybody anticipated. But, you know, it's done now and I'm, uh, we'll see where we go from here. So what's the plan for the next few weeks then, Tony? Uh, the plan for the next few weeks, I would say... Rest and recuperate, enjoy my time with the kids and missus. Uh, the school run was as vibrant as ever this morning. Nothing's changed. Uh, I'm just going to be me. That's, and that, that's a, the, the father, the normal person that I am. And I'll make no rash decisions. I'll be honest, at this moment in time, I'm thinking that could be the last time I would make that ring walk on Saturday. That, that could have been the last one. Uh, I could happily go out on that. I've, I've achieved all all the things I could have dreamed of and more. I've exceeded them, to be totally honest. And uh, I've just defeated the, the former heavyweight champion of the world. Graham, you and I watched the big fight down in London. It was some performance by Bomber, wasn't it? It was a brilliant performance. It really was. It was full of excitement. We, no one was really quite sure what was going to happen. We were expecting fireworks in the first few rounds. I think David Hay helped Tony in some respects. I mean, I know Tony got caught a few times, but I expected David A to come out an awful lot quicker and stronger than he did in the first three or four rounds. It was a little bit cagey, but I think we always, all of us kind of felt that the longer Tony could take the fight on, the, the better chance he'd have, and that's how it turned out. And as you can see from our piece of film there, Tony still in a bit of pain on the Monday. It, it, it's brutal, isn't it? It is, and um, you know, so it was a brilliant fight. Nobody really expected it to go that distance, um, you know. So there was a lot of uh, punches thrown, a lot of hits taken, and uh, you know, he came out victorious, which, which was great. Minus 140 degrees, that ice chamber diamond. But it felt good, though. <laughs> he looked a sore man. He really did. And, and Kevin's right. You know, it's, it's a long time to, to be in a ring with a, a good fighter like David Hay, and he took some of his best shots as well. Let's not forget that. This is, you know, Tony was giving up over a stone in weight to him. So when you're getting hit by somebody like that over a period of 11 rounds. It's an awful lot of punishment to take, but he never really ever looked too troubled, Tony, did he? So credit to him, brilliant performance. He's a terrific lad as well. Always great to see Tony Bellew down at Finch Farm. And he's always got time for the supporters on a match day as well. And that's it for part one of this week's programme. After a short break, we'll bring you highlights of the under-18s win against Wolverhampton Wanderers, and we'll catch up with the Premier League 2 Player of the Month 
Liam Walsh. Welcome back. Now this is the time of the season when the under-18s Premier League table takes on a bit of a new look. The top four in each regional table form an elite league and those who finish between 5th and 8th form another one. Everton are in the second batch this season but they signed off their regular campaign last weekend with a dramatic victory. Everton under-18s came from behind to record a last-ditch 3-2 victory over Wolves at USM Finch Farm on Saturday. Kevin Sheedy's Young Blues raced into a third-minute lead, midfielder Tom Scully with the well-taken finish. Goals either side of the break allowed Wolves to go in front, but the Toffees hit back to level when Karidi Adadoyan bundled home from close range midway through the second half. And with just 60 seconds of play remaining, winger Danny Bramall saw his shot deflect and loop over the goalkeeper to clinch a dramatic victory. The under-18s have finished fifth in the first phase of the season and will now enter a four-team mini-league, as well as defending the Dallas Cup in April. Kev, how would you assess the under-18 season so far? Um, I think we finished where probably we deserved to. Uh, we weren't uh, as strong as we could be in, in some of the big games against the, the teams that finished in the top four. Uh, we got beat by Blackburn at home, which was the, the decider which made we could only finish fifth. But certainly, uh, you know, Saturday we came back from 2-1 down. Uh, there's been a lot of games where we've showed great character to come back from from being behind and get winning goals. So, uh, so I'm really pleased. You know, we've, we've been able to blood a lot of uh, young first-year scholars, so it's been a real good education for them and it'll help them a, a lot for next season. We've shown the under-18s quite a lot on the Everton show this season, Graham, and we love it when they come from behind and show a bit of character, don't we? Yeah, but well, that's what we want at, at Everton. Uh, you know, that we've got a lot of ex-players on the coaching staff for, purely for that reason, in some respects. Not only are they good coaches, but they install the, all the values that we want to see in Everton players. And certainly when you're coming back, you know, from 2-1 down and you're literally a few minutes away from defeat, to turn that round shows good character, yeah. Did you give yourselves just too much to do after a, a bit of a slow start to the season? Yeah, we lost our first three games. Um, we didn't have the, say, our, the older players available, so we lost the first three games against Newcastle, uh, Man United and, and Man City. Uh, but when we got our, our stronger players back, uh, we went unbeaten uh, in 14 games, winning nine of them, and we drew probably a couple of games too many. Uh, but certainly looking back, i um, really pleased. Uh, myself and Paul Tate uh, work with the players every day, and we were pleased with the progress, particularly of some of the players that have real shown marked improvement. So that's the job, is to, get, is to get them improved, and then hopefully they can move up to, to Wednesday with the 23s. It sounds a bit strange, Diamond, when we're talking about the under-18s and Sheed says we don't have some of our older players, but sometimes the difference between being 15 and 16 years of age as opposed to 17 and 18 can be quite significant. Well, it's huge. It? I, mean, I mean, you look at the period from 14 to 18, there's so much growing involved in that, you know, physically, mentally, you know, different problems can crop up in your life. You, you just don't, there's all kinds of things. I mean, Kevin will be far more qualified to tell, tell you about all that sort of situations than, than myself, but, you know, certainly... Some of the first-year scholars who've played in Kevin's side, have, you know, they'll be much the better for it for the next season. They'll be strong in that under-18s group, and you know, it's about the development. As much as we want them to win games of football and finish high up in the table, you, the idea is to push them forward. Can we get them into the 23s? And obviously, hopefully, some of Kevin's better 18s will do that next season. Hopefully, that's one of the many skills I suppose you need as an academy coach, Kev, because you're dealing with players within one dressing room who can be quite significantly very different mature-wise, mentally and physically. Indeed, yes, and we have got the examples of those in, in the squad, but definitely, you know, they're winners. They, 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 every day they don't like losing in five-a-side, you know, which is a great trait. I don't believe in being a, being a good loser. Uh, people who say that have never won anything, so we really instill, you know, the, the will to win, yeah. You're not always going to play well, but have you got that desire? But obviously, the, ultimately, it's the development of the players to make them better uh, in the, and play in the right way, and if you do that and play well enough, you'll win the games. What's Tatey bringing to the gig? Tell us about Paul Tate. Tatey's a great character. Um, he was a scholar with, with Everton, uh, went on to have a real good career. Um, and he's got loads of experience. He's a really good coach. Um, you know, he, he knows what the players, you know, they need. And uh, he's got a great manner with him as well. You know, we really um, encourage him to not to fear failure, you know, to try things, you know, and keep trying and, and improve them in that way. So he certainly uh, is a pleasure working with him. And Tom Davis must be a beacon for every young player at the moment. He should be. 
because you know we, we've shown over the, over the last few seasons that you know if you're good enough, you are old enough. You know, Kieran Dow, Tom Davis, John Joe Ke uh, Kenny's had a shout. Um, you, you know, there's all that there's opportunity for them if they're if they're producing the goods on a regular basis in the under 23s. You know, it's been shown that they can come through. Tom is the standout one at this moment in time. He's the one who's gone into the first team and stayed there. Everybody who else who's had a little sniff of it should be looking at him thinking, I want to be him. This second phase of the league season, Kev, the fact that you're in the, the second division, as it were, does that give you the opportunity to blood even more young players? Uh, certainly, we've got a, well, we've got a few coming back for injuries, but we had about eight players out injured, which gave the opportunity for, for the younger lads. But just going back to what Diamond said about Tom, uh, he was... 16, 15, 16 when he was playing in the 18s because he was good enough and that really stretched him and that sort of helped him part of his development before he did move up to the, the 23. So it's, it's a good for the younger lads to see that, you know, if they're good enough, they'll get picked and then if they, you know, they can show that sort of development and, and, and maturity. Uh, I think Tom's handled it brilliantly mentally as well. He, you know, he's, play, he's played a good ascent with the, the demanding crowd. So I think it's a lot that we try and instill in them is not just the technical but the, the mental strength as well. He's done brilliant off the pitch as well, Tom Davis, which shows just what a good grounding he's had at USM Finch Farm. OK, let's shift up the gears age-wise now and have a look at our under-23s, who, despite losing against Manchester City earlier this week, are still in pole position in their own league table. One of the main contributors to their success has been Liam Walsh, and his consistently good form has been rewarded with the Premier League 2 Player of the Month prize. Well, it's been a great season for myself and the team, and I think this just tops it off for myself, but... What will top it off for the team is winning the league now. Quite simply, he's been outstanding. Uh, not just this last month, but all season. He's, um, he's, he's arguably been one of our best players. Uh, he showed great qualities. Tenacious, um, outstanding technical ability. Um, he's got the lot. He's got, he's got every range of pass. Um, you know, he's learned the, the tactical side over the last sort of 18 months. That's got better and better and better. And what he does is he runs games. He, he doesn't just play in 10, 15 minute periods, he runs a game. Uh, he always wants the football, he is um, nine times out of ten, he's, he's the player who has the most touches in our team and um, there's no coincidence when, we, when Liam plays well, we play well. Um, when I've been in training and even outside the training, whether that's eating right or drinking right and, and whatever, but. Yeah, I think uh, with Unzi as well helping me a lot, you know, he's been pushing me a lot and um, I give me credit to him. I think uh, with Unzi, you know, he's a hard work, he gets all the lads working hard and that's why we're doing so well this season. As with all our players, he's very humble and um, he's, he's, a, he's a cracking local lad and we're very proud of him. Liam Walsh is a smashing footballer, Kevin, isn't he? Great player. Uh, he's been, been the same since he's come through. He was one of the ones, like Tom, was you know playing up at a, an early age. Um, mostly ran the games. You know, every I think went through Walsh. You know, he's got a tremendous range of passing. You know, he's, he's real uh, tactically. He's really astute, um, and he's he's a big part. So I'm really pleased that, for that award. But you know, hopefully he can like Tom break into the first team. You know, he's he's, he's an excellent player. And, um, you know, some that's come through the, the the academy. He strikes the ball beautifully, doesn't he? We've had some of his free kicks on the show this year. Yeah, he's a brilliant technician from, from free kicks and he practices them. Um, as I say, got a great range of passing, short and long, uh, sees a pass and can deliver it as well. So uh, I'm not surprised that he's, he's doing so well. And he likes to tackle as well, which is something else we've mentioned a lot on the Everton show. And the little loan spell he had at Yeovil, they loved him down there because even at League One, League Two level, he was getting stuck in Walsh. Yeah, well, I think sometimes that is the advantage of sending these young lads out on loan. You know, they get to play what I call proper football in some respects, and I mean that in the nicest possible way in terms of playing against men who are fighting for three points on a Saturday afternoon. So he has got the tenacity about him. He's got a little bit of fire in his belly. So with all those attributes technically that he's got, there's nothing wrong with you know, making a tackle, even though the modern day game tries, it looks like he's trying to get rid of it. But uh, no, I like Walsh. He's, I think he's got a good chance. And I think uh, you know, he's got to keep his good work going to the end of the season and then have a really good pre-season next next year and hopefully he can push himself into that first team squad. People regularly mention his size, or refer to him as Little Walshy, but size doesn't bother Liam Walsh, so it shouldn't bother anybody else. There's enough quality players in the Premier League who are well under six foot, for well, example. Of course there is, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, sometimes when you're, you're smaller, you know, there's a bit of a stigma attached to you and people look at you and think, oh, I'm not sure he'll deal with it on a physical basis. But, you know, that's up, for, up to Walshy to show everybody that, that is, you know, size doesn't matter. And he's got to get out there and, and, and run games of football like he's shown. 
you know, this season. So, as I say, next year for me is a big one for him. You have players that go from the 18s to the 23s, have a little run in the 23s, then come back to the 18s. How do they deal with that? Um, generally, OK. Generally, they're, they're good mentally. Uh, we, we do speak to them to say, this, you know, in our experience, this is what happens. You, you will go up there. You will get your opportunities. But then uh, if players come back off loan or players that are injured come back in and at their position, then you'll come back and play for us. And 99.9% .9 of the lads, we, we find, uh, are fine with that. There's a mental toughness, isn't there, involved with stepping up from the 18th grain to the 23s and then from the 23s to the first team? Yeah, of course there is. I mean, there's, there's you know, challenges all the way from what, whatever age you're playing at. But certainly, um, I would guess the biggest jump is obviously from the 23s into the first team and, and staying there. Like Kevin says, you know, you, you know, we've had lads who have gone from the 23s into our first team. Tom's the only one who's really made it stick so far. But that's not to say they can't come again. They've got dropped down to the 23s, push on again. I'm sure the production line will keep on rolling. And that's us for part two. We're at Finch Farm. For part three, we're Morgan Schneider and we'll be answering questions from the Junior Fans Forum. And Ronald Koeman, Phil Jagielka and Graeme Sharp take on the British Open Golf Challenge. Welcome to part three. Now, the Junior Fans Forum are a group of 11 to 16-year-old Evertonians who meet every half-term to give the club some insight into what our younger supporters want to see. At their last meeting, we invited them to put their questions to one of their latest heroes. Here is the Junior Fans Forum grilling at Morgan Schneiderlin. Hi, my name is Amanda and my question for Morgan is, is there anyone you aspire to play like on the pitch? Um, hello, Amanda. Um, of course, when you're young, you always aspire to, to play like someone. My, my idol was Zinedine Zidane, but now I don't play the same role as him. And obviously, I don't have the same quality as him. So I'm looking um, at the players who play at my position, the best like uh, Busquets, uh, Xabi Alonso, and uh, people who are references in, um, in, uh, in defensive midfield to, to improve my game. Hi, my name is David, and my question for Morgan is: Do you have any match day superstitions? Hello, David. Um, well, I don't have any match day superstitions. I, I used to have a lot because when uh, when you're young, you believe in those kind of things. But more you grow up, more more personally, I grow up. I um, I um, let these things away and don't really influence on my uh, on my match day uh, preparation. So. Uh, so no, I, I eat what, uh, what I want to eat, I, uh, I dress how I want to dress and, uh, and uh, I don't have any superstition. Hi, my name is Jamie and my question for Morgan is, as a midfielder, what made you choose the number two? <laughs> Hello Jamie, um, well I can address that finally, thanks for the question. But um, it's just because when I r arrived not a lot of uh, numbers were, were available, it was a uh, it was the number two, I think, or number 40, 34, 36, or something like that. So I just chose to take a, a small number because uh, a 36 was a, a bit too big and everything. So, so yeah, for the moment, it's, a, it's quite a, a number which we are lucky with because uh, we have some good results. So we're going to see at the end of the, of the year if we're still having good results, if I keep it or if I change it. But for now, I'm quite happy with it. My name is Megan and my question for Morgan is how do you feel when the fans sing your name? Hello Megan. Um, when the fans sing my name it's always a pleasure uh, even if it's a hard name to pronounce. You know, I, was, uh, I was very very happy and very honoured by the, the song they, uh, they gave me after one or two games. You know, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's very something very, very nice and uh, it makes me fe feel very very welcome in a, in a football club, and it gives you it gives you more energy when you when you hear the fans singing your names, when you when um, you can see that they appreciate what you what you're doing on the pitch. So it's very it's very nice, and hopefully I, I can give them some more opportunities to sing my name in the future. Graham Morgan Schneider in there telling us that his idol was Zinedine Zidane. Not a bad idol to have. Very good. He wasn't a bad player, was he? At all, and doing very, very well as a manager as well. So, no, it's no surprise as well the French connection there as well. But uh, no, he's, he's he's done terrific, Morgan. You know, and if he turns out to be anything close to Zinedine Zidane, he's going to have a hell of a career. Has he impressed you, Morgan Schneiderlinkov? He has. I've seen him a couple of times live. Um, he, he's always in the right place defensively. Really clever at interceptions, winning the ball back, and he's real astute passes after that. So I've been really, really impressed with him. 
Were your heroes growing up, Graham? Ian Botham. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd try and throw a swerve away at you there, Dad. Probably I, still is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know. I, I, he was, though, seriously, in all honesty. He, I mean, I loved my cricket when I was a kid, and I used to run home to watch Ian Botham. But football-wise, you know, Glenn Hoddle for me. Um, mercurial footballer, mm. sensational passer, scored spectacular goals. You know, really, really good player. I mean, played in a terrific Tottenham side as well. I think mean, both of them had to go with the football lark as well, didn't he? Wasn't well, he just did, a cricketer. Jerry, well, I think he was better off sticking to cricket over there. <laughs> <laughs> Who did you watch when you were growing up, Kev? Um, it was Bobby Charlton and George Best. Um, I was very fortunate to make my second division debut when I was 16 and come on against George Best, so I actually played against him, which was great. And then a bit later on, obviously, Maradona's my, my favourite all-time player. Uh, the 86 World Cup, he more or less won it on his own for Argentina. So uh, I was fortunate to, uh, to go to... Is one of the Seville, and he was practicing his free kicks, and he was putting really? everyone right in the top corner. So uh, <laughs> if he's practicing them, everybody should be practicing them. That game you mentioned there, when he came on for Fulham against George Best, that was the famous game when George and Rodney Marsh played together, wasn't it? Probably the most famous game in Fulham and Hereford's history. And Bobby Moore as well. I actually mm. tackled Bobby Moore, and people said that's maybe the only tackle I made. But uh, <laughs> but no, it was uh, it was just a great atmosphere. It was a full house there uh, to come on as a young lad and play. They beat us five or six one, and we got b battered. But uh, looking back, it was a you know great experience for me. George Best and Rodney Marsh, they don't make them like that anymore. No, I mean they were terrific players. I mean it's, uh, you've got to remember the pitches they used to play on as well. I mean the lads now are playing on bowling greens. You know back in the day they were playing on sand pits, mud you know mud baths a lot. It was uh, you know. Great credit to them because they were they were terrific players. They people always ask, don't they? Could they play in the modern day era? Of course they could because they were good enough. Simple as that. And we'd love to have seen Kevin tackle Bobby Moore, wouldn't we? I'll say. I bet he won the ball <laughs> as well. Well, a few weeks ago, Everton Football Club announced an official media partnership with the British Open Golf Championship. Well, of course, this summer will be staged at Royal Birkdale. To celebrate, we brought the world famous Claret Jug to USM Finch Farm and invited the boss, the skipper, and Sharpie to have a friendly shootout. To celebrate the 146th Open Championship coming to Royal Birkdale, there's an exciting partnership between Everton and the RNA. We have a golfing challenge for you. Simon Holmes here with us as well, the swing detective, to take us through some challenges for these uh, three men. So you're a bit of a golfer, Phil Jagielka, aren't you? I try, yeah. Playoff? Four, eight. How much do you play? Um, well, once, once the weather starts to liven up a little bit, as much as I can. Grand golf a big part of your life? Yeah, I try and play once a week. Uh, obviously, with more time and, and the lads. Ronald Koeman, are you as a competitive golfer as you were a, a player and now a manager? Yes, but uh, when I was playing, I had more time to play and to practice. <laughs> and your handicap, just so we know? Uh, 11. OK, right, so we are set. OK, Phil, here we go, about 60 yards. OK. Birkdale, pounding wind across you. You're going to hit a little sort of chip and run seven iron, keep the ball down on the greens. Little goal, okay, little goal, ten points. Uh -huh. Big goal, five points. Up right there. there we go. Third of three shots. There we go. There we go. There we go. Oh, oh, down. <laughs> five. Oh, get down. Yes. Oh, ten. That was the critical yeah. one. Well, well, the goal for that. Yes. <laughs> Second challenge, and we're looking for the closest to the pin. Ten points for the winner, five for second, and zero for the third. Don't go long, mate. There's water <laughs> behind. Oh, I like it. Get up, get up, 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 up. get up. No, a very tidy yeah. effort. Oh, bunker. Oh, bunker. So the pace was good. Oh, I've gone round the bunker, though. Oh. Oh, oh dear. Ten, five, yeah. zero. Yeah. Last challenge. So we're looking for the long putt. Again, it's closest to the pin. 20 points for first place, 10 for second, 5 for third. And I think probably leader in the clubhouse has to get up there. And so remember what you're playing for, Ben. Yes. Yeah, yeah. remember. Yes. That's hopeless. Got to go, got to go. That is hopeless. No. No! Oh, oh. Yes. Hey! Oh. Got a chance. No. Oh, I think that's inside sharp, is. We're going to need to check this yeah. out because I think this is a long inquiry. That's Ronald, who's come from last, leapfrog. The wise head defeats the two athletes. Early shout for champion golfer of the year. We've got to say, best ass turf golfer in here today. <laughs> <laughs> best ass turf golfer. Winner of the gold medal, champion golfer of the year. Thank you. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Before we talk about the golf, I've got to ask this question. I'm intrigued about you tackling Bobby Moore. Did you win the ball? 
I actually fouled him, uh, <laughs> and he he just looked at me. So uh, so I don't think he's very impressed with this young lad that's come on. But uh, that was it. <laughs> Something to say you you foul Bobby Moore anyway. That will have killed Sharpie that diamond, losing on the final point. Yeah, I mean, it'll be disappointing. I mean, somebody who plays the amount of golf that Graham Sharp does, you know, to not win that tournament, <laughs> it'll be a very, very devastating man. I even, is Sharpie in the Open this year? <laughs> Seriously, I've never, you never see him. I'm, I feel sorry for his missus. I think he sleeps with his golf club, Sharpie. <laughs> Surprised we didn't see Stodds taking part in that. Is, is this true that he's retired from active yeah. golf? Yeah, I mean, he's, I think he's retired active golf, but I've, I've offered him the job of carrying my bag on the odd time that I get to have an opportunity to play but I don't. I can't even mention what the reply was. <laughs> the odd time you get the opportunity that makes me smile. Are you still golfing, Sheets? Um, I've had to stop playing since I had my uh, knee replacements, but um, I'm I'm getting better. So I'll probably one day I'll uh, I'll have a knock. It's great, isn't it, that the Open's coming to Birkdale? Brilliant, yeah. They always have great uh, tournaments there, and you know some been some fantastic winners over the years when it's been at Birkdale. So uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to to go and you know watch one of the rounds. You could probably look out your back window, couldn't you, Graham? Yeah, not not too far. No, it's, uh, it's it's fantastic. I mean, the the village is buzzing for it. Really, I mean, it's mm. it's the biggest tournament that that comes Southport's way. Really, um, so everybody's looking forward to it. It's it's always a great golf course to to play on. It'll be absolutely immaculate, I'm sure. Hopefully, the wind blows a little bit, get a bit of rain in for a couple of hours anyway, to, just to mix it up a little bit. But uh, as long as, the, long as the rain goes off for the early evenings, I'll be happy. <laughs> the gaffer wanted to win that challenge there, didn't he? Well, of course he does. I mean, he's a competitor, always has been. I'm sure they all did. You know, you did, but whatever. We, we all have a mess about and a laugh about everything. But really, you know, any time you're in a, a competition as an ex-player, you know, the old, the old feelings come out and you don't <laughs> want to lose, do you? And it's a forced smile from Graham Sharp there. It really is. OK, we're taking another quick break now. When we return for the final part of this week's programme, we will be speaking to a genuine West Bromwich Albion legend and we'll get the pre-match views of Ronald Koeman. Welcome back to the fourth and final segment of this week's Everton show. Now I promised you a West Brom legend ahead of the Baggies visit to Goodison on Saturday and they don't come more revered at the Hawthorns than Tony Brown. Nobody has scored more goals for Albion than the man, ironically nicknamed the Bomber. I spoke to him earlier this week to get his assessment on West Brom's rise to eighth in the Premier League table, four points and one place below the Toffees. I think the players we've bought of late, you know, uh, good quality players really, you know, people like uh, Nasser Chadley, um, Sibot Livermore, well, he's been superb, you see. Um, and we already had Johnny Evans, and Darren Fletcher, you know, Chris Bunt, James Monaghan. We, we had quality players, but he just added, he just keeps adding, he's added a little bit more to it of recent uh, signings. And um, I think it's allowed us to to open up a little bit and just play a little bit more uh, football, to be fair. We've got a great keeper at the back. I tell you what, Ben Foster's been brilliant this season. Absolutely out of this world. And uh, he's he's been a big factor as well, uh, you know, in uh, in the, the good run we've had this season. But for all the improvements going forward, Tony, it's actually Gareth McCauley, isn't it, who's joint top scorer and he's a centre-back. It sounds strange, doesn't it, when you say who's your top scorer, you say centre-half. I mean, because uh, I do our commentaries, you know, on, uh, for, for local radio and I always keep mentioning that he's he's like a magnet at the back, you know, everything seems to come to him aerially and he kind of he's always heading th everything away. But at the other end, he's, he's a threat as well because, he, he you know, he's a tall lad and he can climb. He's not just improved recently. He's been uh, he's been our best player. I've picked him probably three seasons out of the last four as our player of the season. You mentioned Jake Livermore before, Tony. Just how big an impact has he had? He's come into the side. He's he's got um, he's got a great engine, as they say now in the modern days. He's you know he's, he's very strong in the tackle. He's quick. He's he's got everything uh, for a for a midfielder really, and uh, he's got health, healthy competition, and I think that's the thing they've got you know more more healthy competition all over the park. And just finally, Tony, how do you see Tony Pulis approaching the game at the weekend? What he is, he's got them well drilled and well organised, and that's what you'll see on on Saturday. You know, they won't throw men forward. You know, it'll it'll just be a disciplined performance and uh, sort of absorb pressure and. Uh, 
But now, like I said earlier, you know, we've we've got the players to to spring and break and uh, and score one or two goals. Tony Brown there, an Albion legend. He does know about the art of goal scoring. And as he touched on there, Gareth McCauley, centre-half, is one of the Baggies' joint top scorers, Graham. Yeah, no real surprise, to be totally honest with you, Darren, because you, know, you only have to look at the man in charge, Tony Pulis, and the sides that he's managed over the years, notably Stoke and how strong they were at set-pieces. I think West Brom were equally that. So that's a warning sign for us straight away because, uh, you know... A lot of their play is down to you know getting the ball up to Rondon and winning bits and pieces, and we know what they're like from from set pieces. So very very important that defensively we're we're concentrated and strong on Saturday. And of course you played with one of the best goal scoring centre halves that Everton have ever had. Yes, Derek Manfield. Uh, he scored 14 goals in our title winning season. Um, he had the reactions of a striker when, when we had free kicks. You know I placed the ball down. He's just looking for a blue shirt to move, and he. he He's usually the first one on the move and just put it in front of him and he, he got his head on it and uh, he was a real good goal scorer and that was a you know, massive help towards us winning the league. Double figures in 84-85, you must have set up most of them, I would think. All of them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's a six-pointer game, isn't it? The gap could be seven or one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big game for us. I mean, because it's looking more and more likely now that seventh will potentially be a European spot, something we want back at the football mm. club. We enjoyed it a couple of years ago. Um, so, yeah, vitally important that as I said, we're concentrated. We know if we defend well, we're always going to score goals at the other end. It's a game to look forward to, that's for sure. And Saturday's game will be Ronald Koeman's 31st in charge of Everton. And come the final whistle, there'll be just 10 left of his first campaign at the club. The boss, quite rightly, believes that he's seen real progress in his time at Everton and he's challenging his players to make it a run-in to remember. It's always uh, important to... Uh to feel yourself well in, from the start of from the beginning of the season. And that's really uh, what I felt uh, from day one, uh, comfortable. Uh, everybody likes to help. And of course, you know, if you manage a new, a new football team, you need time to understand, to understand the characters of the players. And the players need to understand uh, how the manager will, will work the system of playing and you need time for that but uh, little by little I think uh, we changed some things in the team we had really some good signings in the summer we started well the season strong but we had a difficult bad period uh, during October November and uh, but uh, till so far it's okay it's really positive I think uh, around the club is, is really a positive feeling I think uh, the start of 2017 was, was really strong. It's a great win against Man City at home. And uh, OK, we, we are in a good, good moment in the season. The team is, is OK. The team is strong. The team is showed a lot of ambition. Fitness-wise, I think uh, we improved comparing uh, to the start of the season. And uh, OK, that, that, that we see and that everybody can, can see that that uh, that difference on the pitch it's, it's it's not always all about running because it's also uh, aspect of football is 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 what you need to do in your ball position but uh, we improved we improved if i compare uh, sessions training sessions uh, if we play six against six compare that uh, the last week uh, to the first week of the season that's a big difference it's, it's more intensity what, what needs to be done at this football club to be considered a top four club? I think still, still it's a difference between uh, home and, and away. I think we need uh, a little bit more uh, consistency away from home. Uh, also in the way how we play. Sometimes, in my opinion, away from home we drop too much back. Instead of what we try to do at home, uh, to press and, and, and to play offensively, I think we can, we can improve in that aspect. Kev, do you agree with the Gafford? There's a lot more intensity to Everton's play as there was early on in the season. Certainly, I think if you look back at the Man City game at home and the second half against Arsenal, it was a real high-pressing game, high tempo. Uh, and the manager touched on it. There's been some disappointing away performances where we maybe sat back too much instead of really pressing them. So I can only see you know, the team improving with that and getting better. 
Defeat against Tottenham last weekend, but it shouldn't dent the confidence too much, Diamond, because it was the first Premier League defeat of the calendar year. Yeah, I mean, no, don't get carried away with it. You don't get too high when you're winning and you don't go too low when you lose a game of football. I mean, I think if we look back at the Tottenham game Sunday, that's where he wants us to be, the manager. He wants us to be able to close down like they closed us down. And in some respects, we can look back and, you know, in the, in the long run, look at that as a lesson in some respects as to how we look to play next season with that kind of intensity because that was as good as I've seen off a team this season. Tottenham were terrific but all three goals, funnily enough, were, were reasonably avoidable. They were, that's just a disappointment. If you score good goals then you know you hold your hand up. Someone put us in the top corner from 30 yards but uh, you know they were poor goals to concede and against a, a top team like Tottenham on the day then it was always going to be a, a, a struggle to get back into it. Just finally, we will be paying tribute to Goodison Park to the great Alex Young on Saturday. Terrific footballer and a lovely man. A really nice man, had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times, very humble guy, um, desperately sad to hear of his passing, but he will no doubt go down as one of Everton's true greats. He will be missed, the golden vision. And that just about wraps up this week's show. My thanks to Sheeds and Diamond for joining us. And there's just enough time for me to remind season ticket holders that the clock is ticking if you want to guarantee your seat for next season. 6th of April is the cut-off date. And trust me, there are plenty of people waiting if you don't want it. Visit evertonfc.com forward slash all for one for more details. And let's hope that it's a season to remember. 1878. St. Domingo's. We know our history. We embrace it. Where football became science. Where vision was golden. Where the Trinity was holy. Where the greatest number nine inspired every number nine. And where players became giants by being nothing but the best. The old lady our home for generations. Where kings play in royal blue. Where we stand together, sing together, fight together. Whatever the outcome, always together. We're more than a crowd, we're a family. Following in the footsteps of our parents and grandparents, the story we will carry on. Our past may define who we are, but we dictate what we become. We're forever Everton, all for one. <laughs>